Welcome to episode 262 of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger. As always, it's brought to you by Botano.ca. Please play responsibly. 19 plus the game starts now. You have all sorts of options. It's Thursday and through the weekend in the National Hockey League. And hey, for hockey fans, even if you're not an NFL fan, Easton Stick is the starting quarterback for the Chargers with the injury to their starter. So maybe if you just like hockey, you might want to go for Easton Stick at Botano.ca. Frank Saravalli joins us. And uh, Frank, man, lots happening uh, in a short period of time in the National Hockey League. I guess uh, the Western Conference, uh, three coaches let go. Uh, Craig Berube, the latest one for the St. Louis Blues. Drew Bannister will step in the interim basis. Uh, man, there was lots of reaction in St. Louis. A lot of fans feeling like this was more construction-based as far as GM than the coach. What do you make of this move by the Blues? I was a bit surprised in the sense that the timing of it. Like, look, I, I've watched the Blues pretty closely this year. I understand that they've played inconsistently. I get that Doug Armstrong wasn't happy with their compete and effort. They've lost to some bad teams and played down to competition. He, Craig Berube gets fired amid a four-game losing streak. I understand all that. I guess. My struggle with it is big picture because one month ago, almost to the day, Doug Armstrong was on, frankly speaking, I sat down with him in Toronto at Hockey Hall of Fame weekend. He was there for his longtime friend and, and coincidentally enough, coaching consultant, Ken Hitchcock. And he had mentioned that, not even mentioned, he acknowledged that this current crop of St. Louis Blues, they're not a playoff team. They are amid a retool that he expects this team to be competitive in two to three years time. And if that's the case, I guess my big question is what has he seen over the last month as this team is one point out of a playoff spot that felt like he needed to make the move right now. Now, if I'm going to back up a step, I've felt for the longest time, and there's always been an undercurrent and or rumblings that, Craig Berube was never really Doug Armstrong's guy. That they won a Stanley Cup together in 2019. He was the interim coach. They won in a game seven. And that, of course, earned him a contract. When you take a team from dead last in the NHL to win a Stanley Cup, you're getting a deal to continue as a head coach. And then there was an extension that came after that. And I think part of the thought process was, at least if you talk to people in St. Louis, that there was never really an opportunity or a reason for Doug Armstrong to make a coaching change, even though he might have wanted to at varying points. And this maybe finally was his opening. What do you make of that? Yeah, it, you know what? If if there's if you're the GM and you're you know you're the leader, and people can argue if it's the, it's the right. Uh, building plan or not, but that's just kind of how it is in the National Hockey League. And if you're not on the same page as the head coach spec, then eventually you, you know they're going to part ways. It's just it's just how it is. Um, and, and even sometimes, uh, you know, Bill Guerin, him and him and Dean Evison were crying when he fired him. So even mm -hmm. sometimes, if if you feel like you're on the same page, you do it. So th this one doesn't shock me in in the NHL. Coaches are hired to be fired. Very few last a, a long time. Uh, I, I I sense. You know, Barube and Armstrong, different personalities is what I've always sensed from them. And and different doesn't mean bad. I just think they're different. And so they're I both pretty hard edged guys. Yeah. Well, Craig, I think is is very firing, you know, no BS type of guy. And but that's you know, what Doug Armstrong, Doug Armstrong is a stone cold killer. Yeah. So I don't know why. I just yeah, I'm with you. Like now, Grant, I don't have any inside information on the Blues. It's not one of those teams that I that I really look at a whole lot, to be honest. But I don't know why. From even from the outside, it always seemed that there was a disconnect in the players they brought in and and how they use them. And and obviously, I think this goes back to the Petrangelo. Like the one big error was that you know didn't want to give him a no movement clause till the very end. But then they've handed out no movement clauses to lots of other players who aren't as good. And that to me, now maybe he learned from it and said, wow, that was a big mistake. But to me, that's when you look at where the blues kind of started to go down and conversely, look where Vegas is, who is their top guy on the back end. You know, when, when you have an elite defender and make no mistake, 
Petrangelo is an elite defender, it can really That's make a difference for your team. You can you can actually chart the path of the Blues being a cup contending team on the heels of winning one to then being a fringe playoff team with Petrangelo's departure. Oh, it's very easy because the way that they've had to backfill since then, it's just you can bring in quantity, you can pay guys lots of money, but none of them are really quite the same. And no. they've spent a lot of time chasing their tail. The Nick Letty acquisition is a great example. Marco Scandella, they've had a, a whole list of players that they've brought in um, on top of Tory Krug, who they obviously already tried to move, that really are just. And it's no offense to them. They're they're not they're never gonna plug that hole. That that well, when you have an elite number one defenseman leaves. And I, I think it kind of goes back to, you know, I think about this all the time. You never want to be dead right. And Doug Armstrong, in this case with Petrangelo, he had had such a hard line trying to negotiate for so long that he finally got to the end 48 hours before. And the whole time he had played this card of. So, yeah, they've been a very competitive team for a decade. And but it is interesting how one significant move can really alter the whole course of your organization. And had they kept. Now, I'm not saying they would have won if they kept Petrangelo, but like Petrangelo over Justin Falk and you go down the list of other guys, like it's not close. Like it's not close in what his impact is going to be on your team. And so, you know, that's probably where maybe Armstrong, you know, comes out and says he didn't leave him because he had him there. And that one decision really hurt St. Louis. Well, Vegas fans should be doing cartwheels because I don't, I don't think Vegas wins the Stanley cup without Petrangelo. Agreed. And, and, and to be fair, when you've had a sustained run of, of uh, success, look like, Time's going to catch up to you. Ryan O'Reilly at some point with the way yep. he plays is going to be long in the tooth. Vladimir Tarasenko, they kind of spurred the end of that. And maybe for not, not for good reason, but by dumb luck that it also happened to coincide with his game, taking a serious downturn. I mean, there's been lots of interesting, you know, points along the way that you can chart for the blues, but after 10 years, as you mentioned, 14 to 22 or whatever, 23, that's, it, I'd, I'd even extend it back a little bit. 2012 is when the St. Louis Blues really started to get good. Um, you can't really ask for much more than that. You and had what? authentic chances to win and you won a cup and maybe you did it in a year that you you didn't have your best team. That's the way, that's the way life works. But the Jesus one thing the Blues Christ. have done well was... They they kind of retooled Frank while they were good with some really good draft picks. Jordan Cairo is second rounder. You know, that's a really good pick. I know he's not off to a great start this year, but if you look at his total since he's come in, pretty good player. Robert Thomas, a 20th overall from 2017, has been a hell of a pick, right? Um, and Jake Tate Neighbor Thompson, is late in the first round. He's starting to get going. He's yeah, got like, 10 goals in 28 games this year. And, and remember now, they, they did move. Uh, Tage Thompson, they drafted Tage Thompson, but who did that get him? Ryan O'Reilly, who won them the Stanley Cup. Like those picks in 16 and 17 were crucial to not only their, their Stanley Cup success, but also to, there's very few teams, like look at Chicago, for instance. When they were at the top, they didn't, like they lucked out finally to get Bedard after missing the playoffs for four or five years, but they didn't have anybody who was ready to take over. Pittsburgh's going to be in the same boat here eventually. The one thing the Blues did well is they were able to kind of retool within and that's hard to do you don't it's, see that very often it's the hardest thing to do and that's why they're really excited about zach bolduke and jimmy snuggerud and all these other guys that are that are coming along the way i i think doug armstrong in his overall thought process and blueprint of two to three years is bang on i think you're going to see that team right back in the mix and they they really need to overhaul their defense over that time yeah I just want Snuggerud to play, just to say the name. That's a that's a great name, Jimmy. It's a great name. Jimmy uh, Snuggerud, Jake yeah. Neighbors. They got a whole list of great names. And Jake Neighbors is really playing well right now for the Blues. I'm not sure that's sustainable long term for him as a player, but uh, you know, hardworking guy uh, from from the Old Kings who's really on a heater a little bit for the Blues. So they've got Joel a goalie. Wilson. They really like Joel Hofer. Yeah, he could be pretty good. So who do they trade though? If if the if Armstrong and then we'll move on from the Blues, but if Armstrong said to you, Frank, that hey, you know what, we're a few years away, I look and you're right on their back end. 
you know, they got a lot of guys, but, but none of them are really have expiring contracts. Like, you know, the one guy who was expiring contract, you thought maybe would have trade value. Doesn't that's Verana. They just sent him to the minors. So you've got Kasperi Kapanen. and I'm not sure how much, you know, value he has Marco Scandella at 33 of 3.2 nope. mil probably doesn't have a ton. Like, who do you see them moving? Like, is it They've all got no it? trades? It's it's yeah. the four guys on their back end with full no trades. Pareko, Krug, Falk, Letty. I think you have to move one of them. Yeah. I don't even really care who it is. Okay. Clear the cap space. Yeah. Well, that you know, hey, teams are always looking for D men. Like Pareko's got a really long contract, but at 6.5 mil for it's a guy not horrendous. Who can... No, it's not horrendous at all. I, th I think there would be lots of interest in a guy like that. Like when you're that big and you move like he does, you know, there's going to be lots of teams interested in him. But the problem is when you're that big and you move like he does, and now you're on the wrong side of 30. But he's a good skater though. Like he, I don't, if the, usually big guys who aren't good skaters, I'd be concerned, but Pareko's an unbelievable skater for his size. Yeah. I'm just, wh at what point does the age chart catch up with you in the contract is the question teams would have to be asking, right? Yeah, probably. I think they would look and say, well, we'll live with it for the first, yeah, the first three years. Right. Yeah. And then you, and then you move on. Um, Quickly, it came out this week, Frank, that there's going to be some changes to the, uh, to the skills competition at the, uh, at the NHL all-star game. They, uh, they went out and they, you know, they talked to some players. Connor McDavid had a big uh, play in it. There's basically going to be 12 skaters competing for the uh, million-dollar prize. The first eight will be the elite players selected from a larger pool of 44 All-Stars. And then the final four will be voted on by the fans. We won't see a John Scott get in. It's going to be guys who are announced to the All-Star team. What do you make of the change? I like it. I mean, Tyler and I were at the All-Star weekend last year in Florida, and it was really bad. The skills competition was awful. So yeah. I like that they're putting some different thought into it this year. I love that the players got a seat at the table, specifically Connor McDavid, which I would imagine with his planning part of this process that he will also then be participating, yeah. which is, is huge. And it's in Toronto. So there's going to be increased eyeballs. Like you, you're not gonna be able to get away with it. Like you might have when it was in Florida, fans are yeah. actually going to be expecting legitimate, exciting stuff and competition. And so that plus you also have at your disposal, increased sponsorship dollars. When you've got it in Toronto, brands want to be part of it. Not that they didn't before, but I think it just puts that on steroids. And so you mash all those things together, player participation, a smaller group where you're not having to wedge in 36 skaters and you, you, you curate your selection, your list of players, eight, that are going to be picked by the NHL and NHLPA and four by a fan vote that I think you find a way to get the best of both worlds. And then you put a million dollars on the line and not to say that Connor McDavid's turning his nose up at a million bucks, but I don't think anyone is with that kind of cash on the line. You might have some guys where it really is a life changing amount of money. And I, I just think that plus the structure of, once you start the competition, you keep going all the way through as opposed to, hey, I'm doing the fastest skater today and then I have to sit here cold for an hour until my next event. That drove players nuts. Absolutely yeah. nuts. So I go 100 miles an hour at the start and I've got to you know, risk pulling a hamstring or a groin and then trying to fly around the ice and then you want me to sit here for the next hour and do nothing? Like, that's hard to do. So... I think this buy-in is going to be real. I think a million bucks is great. Sign yeah, me up. Hopefully, hopefully there's a, a charitable bonus from that. But here's, so for people who are wondering, here's the six events. So the participants will choose their four of the six that they want to partake in. Fastest skater, hardest shot, stick handling, one-timers, a passing challenge, and accuracy shooting. And then... It's, all, it's, it's By the way, isn't it the Cheetos accuracy shooting? Is okay, maybe. Called? Yeah. How, yeah. how do you do? How do you have accuracy shooting with Cheetos hands? Come on, get out of here. And hey, by the way, I don't know about you. We know what Tyler's drunk snack of choice is. He comes home and he cooks himself frozen vegetables with butter. Do you have a drunk snack of choice? Mine's, dude. Cheetos have been my go-to forever. Really? Oh yeah. Uh, no, if if I'm if I'm eating something when I'm buckled, then usually it's going to be either a Donair. Or uh, I'm getting uh, chicken McNuggets and a 
cheeseburger with no onion. That's okay. So, so if, so people aren't from Edmonton and I, I've had this question even when I go, can you properly explain to our listeners what a donair is? Well, donair, I guess the easiest way would be it's, so it's, it's almost like it's in a, in a wrap in, in essence, right? So it's a wrap and then you have now donair meat depends on which place you get it at. Right. But don't air meat can be a, a difference of beef. Some will have chicken. Some are mixed in together. And is then some, but it's some fried. of them lamb. Uh, some are. Yep. And so it, it's kind of shaped. So it's like a big, like almost looks like an oval of meat and they'll, they'll strip it off. Right. Then they grill it. And now then you can throw in like to me, the big key is the don't air sauce. Right. And it varies from place to place. But the donair sauce for me is the game changer. Then you put in what you want. Like some people put in lettuce and tomatoes. Some put in onions. Gross. I think it ruins it. But um, yeah, it's just donair is unbelievable. It's hard to describe the taste of donair meat, but it's aged for a long time. And it's like spices and put together. It's really tasty, man. It's unreal. I love and a the- donair. There's there's very few, though. Like I haven't had a donair in years because to me. Well, at least that after the bar, because there's none that are good on like from the bar that I go to, to my house, there's no good don't air places that are open at that time. Now, when I was in my heyday partying on the kind of the down the party strip, Roadrunner Automotive, a Roadrunner don't air, Frank was without question the best don't air place. And it wasn't just drunk because we tried it a few times sober in the day and it was still just to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. The, explain don't air sauce. It's like a mayo based yeah, a little bit. Like it's it's, it's a white. Spi- it's cream. almost like a spicy mayo, or is that kind of? Yeah, but like wait. Well, see, like I don't mind mayo, but I don't love mayo. So, um, no, I would. It's a good question. Like I'm the worst at describing it. I don't know what's on it. But to me, it's great. So I would say it's almost a little bit. Tastes like a little bit of Greek, just not as not as um as spicy as Greek. But with the to me, it's the spice of the meat mixed in with the sauce that makes it such a good combination. Hmm. And. We learned one thing about you from this segment. Jason Greger does not like onions. God, I hate him. Like it's a psychological uh, allergy is what I like to say. I just, yeah, you couldn't, man, you could honestly, I don't think you could, I hate onions. Like, so now if you, if you dice them up into a chili and it's really small. And even if I go to someone's house and they have, it's like some people have big chunks of, of onions in their chili or some even put onions on a, on a salad. Like, I'll just put it on the side of my plate. Like, it's not like I can't eat it, but I just, I always prefer not to. So for our American listeners, I went to Outback yesterday and I got the blue oh, steakhouse. Onion. Yeah. Okay. We used to have those here. We don't have any more. They didn't, it wasn't, didn't have a great run here, but they it, were it's, good. I, I, I think it's like a, a less classy version of the keg is how I would explain it. Yeah, that's fair. And, uh, they have this blooming onion. They take an onion and they have a big giant white onion and then they have like a slicer and it slices it and then they bread all the petals and then in the middle they have like a spicy sauce. And I was all over that last night. Now, so I, I, tzatziki was the word I was looking for, Frank. So I would yeah. say it kind of, you know, don, donair sauce can be a little bit tzatziki. Now, I know in the Maritimes, in the East Coast, their donair sauce is made basically from like uh, cond- sweetened condensed milk, vinegar, and garlic. And it's really the garlic with the meat that makes it awesome. So, and then you just want to make it thick. So, if anybody else, and, and it's served on a pita, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's in, yeah, it's like a wrap pita. Yeah. It's not open face, way too messy. You have to wrap it up. And then, and that's the other key, Frank, is some places will have their sauce too runny. And then as you eat it, it drips out the bottom. It's brutal. Like that's so is, is Donair dangerous. different than shawarma? A little bit, yeah. Shawarma is just different meat, but they kind of, they look similar. Is uh, so the they use a different kind of meat. Yeah, like I've honestly, I, I've only ever had shawarma once. Not my thing. So I, and, I'm and not an expert on it. I would probably just mock myself. I would embarrass myself if I try to talk intelligently about a shawarma. So I've had it once. I didn't really like. It. And what would you say is the origin of donair? Is it is it Middle Eastern? Um. Good question. I think a lot of people, I think donairs in Canada started on the East Coast. I have no idea who brought it to the East Coast, but that's where like they Alberta and and the East Coast, like the Maritimes, those are the donair capitals of Canada for sure. Like there's more donairs there than anywhere else. And you would say donair falls into the unhealthy category, right? 
Well, it all depends, Frank, on what your version of unhealthy is. Not at I two mean, in the morning. For me, everything is unhealthy. So I think it's very healthy at two at two in the morning, right? It's I would would I eat a donair every day? No, but no, you you mix it in every now and then. It's fine, but yeah, it's not gonna. If they put it on the old food group chart, it's probably not going to rank up there in the uh, super healthy category. Now, maybe you want to throw in some vegetables on it to to try to help uh, to increase the health factor. That would work. Mm. I'm kind of hungry now. Dude, honestly, have you ever, next time you're here, I, I you must have come to a good donair. No, every place, every time I come to Edmonton, everyone's like, hey, let's go for a donair. We never do. What? We never, ever do. Okay. I will, I will put it down. It is December 14th. The next time you're in Edmonton, we're going for donairs. Mark it down, guaranteed. But I want to go to a good, and I don't want to go to like a fly-by-night donair place with weird meat. No, no, I'm no, a no. very particular about about there's meat. actually a very good one right by my house just a small little one the the roma pizza and don't air place really good and the pizza is sick so that's a that's a place uh, i would recommend uh, uh, that's suspect there's no sick pizza in edmonton what are you talking about there's man? no way dude i'm from the east coast you got no chance no it's funny like when i i remember i the first time i went to new york everybody's like you gotta have the pizza you gotta have the pizza so of course you know we're out we're partying whatever so it's three in the morning we're having the pizza and i'm not a big fan of when i hold the pizza it's like this and all of a sudden it's just limp pizza and it's down it's thin it was all saucy i was like i didn't really love it uh, maybe i had a bad maybe i had a bad i experience. think you had a, probably went to a bad pizza place but but um, I was with New Yorkers. It was their recommendation. I, you got to do. You, you need some crispy New Haven pizza, Connecticut. Right. Oh, it's, and then de, there's so many good pizza places in Philly, man. I'll take you next time you come down. All right. I'm in. I love pizza, man. Like I'll say uh, we have Chicago deep dish here. It's really good. I love the deep dish pieces, man. That's not even pizza. If you eat it with fork and a knife, that's not pizza. No, no, no. It's no, it's just thick. So I don't need one slice is like a stand is, here. is like a, a meal with a knife and fork. Well, that's what people do in Chicago with deep dish. Oh, it's embarrassing. God. Yeah, that is embarrassing. You can't eat pizza. Who eats pizza with cutlery? My God, you should be kicked. If you're at a party and you have cutlery, I'd kick you out. You're like, you're out. Go sit outside. Finish it. It's like, we're not that classy. It's pizza. Pizza is one of the pizza is one of the few foods that you should eat with your hand. Let's, uh, let's switch gears here. We've got more around the league we'll get to, but let's bring in uh, Tyler Ramchak first. Ty, how you doing? Yeah, I'm very excited to interrupt that conversation. You guys covered a lot of ground there. You've covered, I think, three or four different food topics now on the show and only two hockey topics. So uh, I'll get this thing back on the rails. Speaking of donairs, pizza, whatever, you can get it all delivered right to your door with DoorDash. And for a limited time, True. our Canadian True. listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more. You just got to download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code NATION25. Uh, you guys talked about Craig Berube. Let's start with the topic of coaching changes. We've already seen three this year, which is crazy. Your question is, we will see blank more coaching changes this season. Frank? Zero. Ooh, everyone's safe. Hmm. Yeah, well, if you... It's a good question, actually. Um, there's really only one that I think maybe, and that's Ottawa, but they're actually starting to play well. So I don't, I don't see why they would do it. So, yeah, you know what? I, I probably would, unless there's a surprise team that suddenly just, you know, goes in the shitter, I'm uh, I'm probably going to agree with Frank. If I were to shade one team, my guess, if I were to add, like, let's say things really go off the rails somewhere. If they really went off the rails in New Jersey, I think they would make a coaching change. Hmm. That's fair. That's, if that um, team is on track to potentially not make the playoffs or something, I, I don't I don't view that as being an option. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I mean, it is a good point when you look around the league and kind of see who's still in their first year behind the bench on some struggling teams. What about... Like zero shot, even though things stay ugly in Buffalo. Hey, you don't think there's any appetite for change there? Not with Don Granado, no. Okay. No. And by the way, how volatile has the coaching market been? Rick Tockett is the 21st longest tenured mm -hmm. coach in the league, and he was hired earlier this calendar year. 21st yeah. in a 32-team league. That's, 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 that's batshit crazy. Yeah, like if you look, Frank, from from February 9th, that's when uh, Marty St. Louis was hired in 2022. So that's less than two years. The only coaches, and we're not even there, but the only coaches who haven't been in the league, um, who have been in the league more than two years on their team 
Andre Turney in Arizona, Hackstall in Seattle, Granado, Lindy Ruff, Sheldon Keefe, DJ Smith, McClellan, Rod Brindamore, Jared Bednar, Mike Sullivan, John Cooper. So I don't see any of those other teams like you're going to get rid of a coach and within under two years. Like, yeah, I, would see, I know, I guess technically the orders just did it. So anything's possible, but um, it would seem a little odd to me. And none of those guys we listed at, uh, you know, like I don't see New Jersey. Like, I, it's a good point, Frank, about New Jersey. I just don't see them. T- I think New Jersey, now that they're healthy, are going to go. So yeah, they're they're starting to figure it out again. They're seven and yeah. three in their last ten, but they've got ground to make up, and they haven't been the model of consistency this year. No, they haven't. And Lane Lambert, some thought maybe, but uh, the Islanders are uh, are on a roll. We'll get to them after uh, your rem chat. Yeah, seven wins in their last ten. Uh, speaking of trying to make up some ground, the Pittsburgh Penguins need to do exactly that, but they've won back to back games now. The Pittsburgh Penguins have a blank percent chance of being a playoff team, Jason. Ooh, I'm not even going to look at at, uh, at any of the uh, the models. Um, well, it's amazing they won some games because their power play showed up finally, so that helps. Uh, like their power play, it, it made no sense to me how you could be that bad for that long on the power play. So, I will say, like I'm still not sold on the Flyers, the Capitals, uh, even the Red Wings in the playoff spot. So I'm going to say Pittsburgh. I still give them like a 65 percent chance to make the playoffs. Wow. 65 is a lot. You realize that they missed last year, right? Yeah. But they're only like, they're four points behind Philly for third in the Metro. The Metro is not very good right now. It's a really high number. I'm just looking at some of the models right now. Our guy, Micah Blake McCurdy at hockey biz. Guess what his, guess what he has the pens at? Oh, probably 38, 49. Oh, there you go. Okay. Money Puck has both the Bolts and Penguins below 40%. Yeah, but look, talk to me in a week. That's the thing about those models. Like, that's a percentage yeah. thing. It changes so quickly. Yeah. Well, the, this one's different. It factors in a lot more than just where they're what at right now. now. Yeah. What's your number, Frank? Uh, 45. I think they have a less than 50-50 shot to get in. Yeah, I think I'm probably leaning more towards, yeah, just a hair below 50 50. Uh, I'm, last just cu- I'm just curious before we go, what do they have the Islanders, Flyers, and Capitals at? Flyers 37, Islanders 51, Capitals 44. Hmm. So, all right. Interesting. All right. Last one I got for you guys. Remember last week, a couple weeks ago, I asked you about, you know, if you were starting an NHL franchise from scratch, which goalie duo you would pick? Similar ish question, but it's based on the matchup of Connor versus Connor. And it got me thinking if the Come whole on, league was wiped out and brought down into a fantasy draft, Don't right? Contract it. out the window. The only thing that mattered is player ability and age, I guess. Like the league starting from scratch, every player's in the draft. Connor Bedard would go blank overall. Frank? Two. Really? I mean, maybe someone would pick Makar too, but I I think it would be something like McDavid one, Bedard two, Makar three. Hmm. Now, is this a draft? Like, this is just a, a draft, or all teams all teams are starting equal? Everybody folds. They're starting from scratch. Who goes first? Who go? When does Bedard go? Is the question. Hmm. Contracts don't matter. ELCs, whatever, throw them out the window. Starting from scratch, picking teams. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if he would go two, to be honest. I'm definitely taking McDavid. I'm definitely taking McCarr for sure. Um, I would strongly consider uh, Quinn Hughes. I think he is a defenseman, just control the game so much and he plays so much. But more than um, Bedard? Yeah. Um, See, Quinn Hughes over Bedard is a fascinating choice. Yeah, so I I really like Quinn Hughes, man. The more I watch, I, him, obviously, like, obviously, yes, obviously you do. Yeah, I, I, so. you, I mean, you talk about controlling the game, like, like uh, Bedard, he always has the puck on his stick, and he's eighteen and doing it with no help. Yeah, no, it's very well. That's why he always has the puck in the stick because there's no one else to carry it. <laughs> uh, um, so but yeah, he, he, yeah, I'm gonna say he'd go four. All right. There you go, guys. That is a uh, wrap on this week's edition of Fill in the Blank, delivered by DoorDash. Make DoorDash your holiday hack this holiday season. It'd be interesting if 
you know, you look because there's the age of certain players, right? That that obviously impacts this for sure. But like, I think one player that never really gets talked about about how dominant he is is Nikita Kucherov. And uh, yeah, like, but at his age, I'm not taking him. Well, well, 100. That's what I'm saying. But man, like he's been he's been really good, man. Like, you know, really. I would good. take like, McKinnon before him. I would take Drysaitel before him. Over Kucherov, second highest points per game the last. I'm taking a years. center over wingers every time. Yeah, wow. And twice on Sunday. That guy scores, man. I like him a lot. So I, he's really good, and he's one of the few play driving wingers that exists. I'm just. Yeah, you're did right. Did you like, see he's not... McKinnon last night? Oh yeah, no, Nathan McKinnon is. Dude, Nathan yeah, McKinnon he's... put Jeff Skinner in the second row last yeah. night. Hey, speaking hey. of the abs, did what? <laughs> Now, I get that it's his job, but, man, it, like Arturi Lekkonen's dad over in Finland, I don't know if people uh, heard it, he's ripping on Rantanen's training and stuff, and then Rantanen goes out, rips him in the post game afterwards. <laughs> I can't, you don't see that very often. Like, it's just, you know, it's it's a unique situation. And I understand that, you know what, uh, you, you know, you, you're an analyst, so you're going to say stuff. But, man, Rantanen's been pretty good. Like, I thought it was a, it was a really, dr- like, an odd drive-by complaint. It was good, you know, and uh, there's actually one thing where I got a lot of extra energy, you know, one of our Finnish NHL players' dad was talking shit about me in media that I didn't train last summer like I used to do, and, and uh, he was just making, making things up, so I think that was, that was for him, you know, uh, if, you, if you talk shit, it's going to come back at you, so. It, it kind of felt like, and I don't know, because I don't, read or speak Finnish. I don't know the full extent of it, but I actually happen to know Arturi Lekkonen's dad really well. Ismo Lekkonen, because he comes to the Stanley Cup final every year as part of his Finnish broadcasting duties. And so great guy, very mild mannered, like certainly not one to be stirring the pot. And I think there were some comments that were picked up in a different outlet that sort of basically hinted like, hey, Rantanen was just too busy last summer, different charity obligations, things going on events that maybe he just didn't have time to properly train. And so Rantanen took that as like, he, he read it and was like, Holy smokes. He he was breathing fire. He used that as motivation going into that game against the flames at a three point night. And he, he basically said afterward, look, if I'm not playing well, that's fine. Like criticize me for that, but don't make shit up. And I know oh, that 100%. I know that Ismo Lekkonen had reached out to try and smooth things over. And, um, you know, I'm sure it's, it'll end up being nothing. Lekkonen, Arturi Lekkonen and Rantanen are good friends. Just odd to, to have two guys from the same country on the same team. And also odd in general for someone to have their dad be a commentator yes. back home. That sort of adds into the weirdness of it. But it was, it was certainly fascinating. Well, and the thing is, like, Ranton has got 37 points. Like, he he's tied for eighth place in league scoring right now. So his, quote, bad year, Frank, is one that other players would die for. I don't, like, it's it's funny sometimes where, you know, a he star had player, no goals in nine straight games heading into that game that that was part yeah. of it. Sure, I know, I get it. But to me, it's, you, there's no reason, to, I'm not a big fan of the hyperbole analysis where, it, okay, you know what? It's nine games, hasn't scored a goal. But if you look at his overall game and his overall season, like the guy is still one of the best players in the game. Like I, I wouldn't be concerned. Like you're more concerned with guys who are sitting there and, you know what, maybe sitting with 19 points, you know, at this point in the season. That'd be, I think that'd probably be a little bit more of a fair assessment to say, hey, what's going on with him? Right. But he's still, he's got 30 seconds. When you're top 10 score in the league, it's hard for me to say you're having a bad year. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, a few other questions. What about the Islanders? Are you, uh, are you, are you buying the Islanders? Have they found their, uh, their tonic? Were we all wrong and Lou was right? Or is it just a hot streak? They seem to be believing just listening to some of the players the last few days. And the record's actually quite good. Uh, 14, yeah. seven and seven, like only seven regulation losses. That, that ties the New York Rangers right at the top. Uh, they found a way to to milk out six extra overtime losses, which is certainly beneficial in the standings. Um, I'm just, I, I'm not 
I'll answer this holistically. Like I'm not a long-term believer in the Islanders. I'm not. Can they be Fair. a playoff team this year? Yeah. I mean, why not? But I just, I'm not, I'm not sold on viewing the Islanders as a threat. And I think that's really the big distinction to make when looking at this team moving forward. They're also really fair. top heavy. They've got four guys who drive the bus on that team. And a lot of the rest of their scoring is they really struggle. Yeah. Hey, Noah Dobson is having a hell of a season. And, you know, Matt Barzell's having one of his best years basically yep. since his rookie season. So, um, yeah, he's, uh, you know, D Dobson's got what? I think 20 is over a point a game player um, in New York. He's been excellent. But yeah, they. 3.07 goals per game. They're 17th in the league. Like they, they got guys who score goals. Like Holmstrom's got eight goals. Uh, they well, don't get Holmstrom, a lot of the, the amazing part about Holmstrom is that he's leading the league in shorties. He's got four. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, good for him. Like that's a, you know, are you going to score? Are you going to score four shorties every uh, 27 games? Probably not. Like when was the last guy to have 12 shorthanded goals? Like Mary Lemieux maybe. So um, you don't see it very often, but yeah. Good for him. I, yeah, the Islanders, like the Metro's wide open, Frank. Like Carolina, I don't know if there's like a just snap your finger and suddenly their goalies are going to play better. Like that to no, me is No, and concern. that's the one thing. The Islanders goalies have been really good. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. it's it's right. I, if it's not two, then it's three in terms of best tandem in the league. Oh, yeah. No, hey. And, and the, like Varlamov was a little bit better early on, but now Sorokin's playing like Sorokin. So, yeah, no, they're... Their goaltending's good, and we thought that's the one thing that might be able to carry him. I said, hey, if, if they make the, the playoffs, Sorokin would, could win the Vezna. I wouldn't be shocked at all. So, mm -hmm. But uh, I think they got to get in. Frank, have a good week. Or maybe I'll just call you Spec the rest of the episode. So uh, sorry about that, but uh, we'll, I'll get your name right next time. We've only done 270 of these things. so That's it? All right. uh, shouldn't read an article right before I start the pod. <laughs> Good article, by the way. I'd recommend it for anybody. Uh, Zach Hyman talks very openly about his uh, Jewish heritage. So good article. Have a good weekend. Oh, a fun question for you, Frank, before we go. Of course, uh, how are you in the Daily Survivor? Are you still in this week? No, I I got eliminated. <laughs> I, I made it through day one. Yeah, yeah. I selected the correct outcome. Dallas beat Detroit, which was great. What'd and you lose? I lost on the Yotes having to beat the Pens. Oh, yeah. Hey, the Penguins power play woke up. It crushed you. They did. And the Yotes, they're on a downward spiral. Win five, lose four. Uh, well, so they're coming back down. The, the, the West is starting to, to get where people thought it would be as far as the teams that are in a playoff position. Um, Edmonton and... Yeah, Edmonton is very Certainly close. a weird, weird week for the Minnesota Wild. Their assistant oh. GM and their cap specialist, Chris... Now, what do you make of that? They quote mutually agreed to part ways. I there's clearly some kind of discipline here as a result of what Michael Russo in the athletic reported as multiple investigations. A very fluid situation in Minnesota is what I can say. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh that's the story. Yeah, yeah. Russo will definitely be all over that for sure to find out uh, what happened there. But it was odd. You're right, because it was kind of like the right-hand man for Bill Guerin and uh, no longer there. Very surprising. And by the way, this this daily face-off survivor pool, it's like no joke. There's only 38 guys left after two days this week. 38 Dang. people left out of 565. Now, every week, your chance to play the uh, Wendy's Daily Faceoff uh, Survivor Pool. Go to dailyfaceoff.com. It's right there. You'll see it. Uh, you can get uh, weekly prizes with their new limited edition chicken strips and Frank's favorite, the French Toast Sticks. Uh, sign up at Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool. You win the weekly prizes. But And it's not too late. You can go on a heater. You could win $5,000 cash. Who's ever has the best overall success at the end of the year is going to take home the grand prize of $5,000 in cold, hard cash. So play now at dailyfaceoff.com, the Wendy's Survivor Pool. Just try to beat Frank every week. Give you, you know, might not be that difficult. Uh, it, uh, trust me, the last few weeks, it hasn't been. <laughs> awesome. Well, good luck to the remaining 38 this week, and uh, we'll try again next week. Have a good one, Frank.